All right, welcome to section 2.9 out of the book. This is the final section in this chapter. It is bringing together some more of the ideas that we've seen um, about uh, linear independence and and, uh, and basis and so forth, and gonna bring them into more of a comprehensive package. Um, and it's, we're also gonna introduce a couple of other items here called dimension and rank. So, First off, we're going to get an idea of a coordinate system. Okay, so let's approach this in terms of a two-dimensional space to kind of position it in your head of how this, this works. So consider a point on the plane such as 2, 3. And think about what 2, 3 really means. 2, 3, we kind of think of it in terms of 2 in the, direct, in the x direction and, one, and 3 in the y direction. So that's what that, that's kind of how we tend to think of, of it. But if we think about this in terms of a basis for R2, now what's a basis for R2? We saw that it is le linearly independent vectors that span all of R2. In other words, you can build every point in R2, every vector in R2, out of your vectors. We've seen the idea of a standard basis. So the standard basis is the easiest one out there, 1, 0, and 0, 1 in the case of R2. These vectors, you can interpret them as vector of length 1 in the x direction and a vector of length 1 in the y direction. Okay. Then when we think about it in this term, 2, 3 means go 2 units in the direction of the first vector then three units in the direction of the second vector. And that gives us, that brings us up to two, three, which we can think of as a vector itself. We can think of the point two, three as being the vector, that vector going up to the point two, three. So when we think of it this way, not in terms of kind of a really rigid set X and Y coordinates, but in terms of we have these two vectors. One vector is going one unit in the x direction, the other vector is going one unit in the y direction. And what we're doing is we're taking two copies of the first vector and three copies of the second vector, putting them end to end, and where we end up is the vector that we're trying to reach. Coordinate systems are really just saying how how far do I have to go in one direction? Then how far do I have to go in the other direction? And those directions don't necessarily have to be in the X and Y direction, as we're going to see. So when we think of it this way, these are coordinates that describe how to put vectors together. What's special about 1001? Nothing. It is convenient. It's easy to picture and we're used to it. That's the only special thing about it. When you think about it mathematically, it is a basis of R2, meaning you can build everything in R2 out of it. But it's not the only thing. There's nothing really any spe really special about it. That point R2, or the vector R2, can be built using any basis. So just to reiterate, when we have our basis, our standard basis, we're saying put two vectors together of our first vector, put three together of our second. But now what if we change our basis? Take this, four negative one and one negative two, and they're graphed out on here. These are our two basis vectors, four negative one, and negative one, two. So now, if instead of thinking about R2 being built by one, zero, and zero, one, we think of R2 being built by four, negative one, and negative one, two, we can stitch those together to get any point at all. This diagram on the right side shows if you take one copy of our, our of the second vector, sorry, that should be, uh, yeah, that, that's right, I have these. I have these backwards. This is four, negative one, and negative one, two. So if we take one copy of our first vector, 
followed by two copies of our second vector, we're going to end up at that building that same 2, 3 vector, or you can think of it as the point 2, 3. What does this mean? This means that the coordinates that for this, we can, we can say we have coordinates for this basis. We can say that since to get to our point 2, 3, we have to use one copy of our first vector and two copies of our second vector. We can say that we have coordinates 1, 2 when we use this basis. And the terminology we use is the coordinates in relation to a basis. So we write it as, well, V was our point 2, 3. to point 2, 3, or we think of it as the vector 2, 3. And now we're saying, how can I build this vector out of my basis? Well, this says to build the vector V from my basis B, my coordinates are 1, 2. One copy of the first vector plus two copies of the second vector. See, mathematically, it's saying one copy of the first vector plus two copies of the second vector it's just a linear combination, gives us 2, 3, which is the same as the matrix, where that's our first vector, and the second column of the matrix is our second vector, times 1, 2, times the coordinates, gives us the vector we're, we're interested in. So coordinates although we're very used to coordinates being in the x direction and y direction, mathematically, we're just saying you take one copy of your first basis vector, two copies of your second basis vector, put them together, and it gives you the point you're interested in. You express it in that way. If you are using your standard basis, you, you'll often drop the, the little b. When you put a b there, it means that you're using a special basis the non-standard basis, but you can also think of it as a matrix vector multiplication to give you the, the vector you're interested in. You can, if you're using the standard basis, as I said, quite often you'll drop the notation, but you will sometimes see it written this way. You'll sometimes see the standard basis written as kind of a script S and the coordinates in relation to S, the standard basis, are 2, 3. That's really just saying 1, 0, 0, 1 times my coordinates, 2, 3, gives me my final vector, 2, 3. So, Here's something to note. When you have a basis for a subspace, any vector in that subspace can be uniquely represented by a linear combination of the vectors. Now, why is this? Remember what a basis is. A basis is a generating set. In other words, you can build anything in your subspace, but it's linearly independent. What did linearly independent means? Linearly independent means that when you build something out of them, there's a unique answer. There is only one way. So when you have a basis, your, your coordinates, which are the a1, a2, up to ak, those coordinates are unique because it's a linearly independent. So again, this is drawing in an idea of what we saw before, linear independence, but using it in terms of the basis. And one of the consequences is that because of that, you can get these coordinates which are going to be unique. It only works because the basis is linearly independent, which our definition says it has to be linearly independent. So example, let V be a subspace with this basis. Write that as a linear combination of the vectors in B. So here's our basis. What we're asking here is we're asking you to, in other words, what are the coordinates 
of V in B. Or in terms of our notation, what is V for our basis B? What are the coordinates of that vector in our basis? So finding these coordinates is the same as solving a system of linear equations. You're asking what are the coefficients you need? How do you have to combine these vectors in, a, in, in order to get your, your vector? That implies one important thing about bases. Normally when you're talking about bases, you have them in a certain order. When, you're t when you are getting coordinates, you have to keep the basis elements in the same order. That's the first, second, and third. So you can play with them a little bit, but but when you're getting the coordinates, you have to know what order they're in. So how can we do this? How can we get the coordinates of that vector? Well, we want to know how to combine those three vectors to get the final vector. So we build the augmented matrix. And you'll notice that this one is quite nice we can, we can, let's say we do row three exchange with row one, gives us negative one, four, two, three, and so on. Oops, that's a zero, zero, negative one, one. Now we're going to take row one minus row two is the new row one. Gives us negative one, zero, zero, one, one. And finally, we are going to do um, row two plus two row three is the new row two. It gives us this. And I am going all the way. That is a four. I'm going all the way to row reduce echelon form with this one. Here, I'm going to combine a number of things. Negative row one is the new row one. Uh, one quarter row two is the new row two. And negative row three is the new row three. So I'm doing three elementary row operations together. So we get the coordinates of our vector, which is one, two, three, in relation to our basis B is equal to negative one, one, negative one. It tells us how we can combine those vectors to get something. And that's what coordinates are. Coordinates are simply how do I combine vectors in order to get where I'm going. So here's a definition. If we have, the definitions are kind of wrap it up. If we have a basis, you need to have a basis. It has to be linearly independent and they have to be in order. So you have to have a set order of the elements in the basis. So for any vector in Rn, this is where we have a basis for Rn. We have unique scalars that are the coefficients for our uh, linear combination. And then once you have that, put them together into a vector and it's called the coordinate vector of V relative to B using that notation. That's just a summarization of what we've seen. Another quick example, if we have B equal to that, find the coordinates of V relation to that, that um, relation to this basis, we build the matrix of our vec of our um, our basis vectors, augment it with what we're trying to find. Row reduce, row one minus row two is the new row two. 
Um, negative one quarter row two is a new row two. And again, this isn't using the strict Gaussian method for row reductions, but it's going to end up with the same answer no matter what I do. Row one plus row two is the new row one. You get one, zero. Three plus one half is seven over two. Zero, one, and one half. So I get that the, the coordinates of V in relation to that basis is equal to 7 over 2 and 1 over 2. Again, that is, that means I take half the first vector, or sorry, 7 over 2 times the first vector plus 1 half the second vector gives me what I'm looking for. Another example. Now, I'm telling you that this set is a basis of R3. Now, what does this mean? This means that they're linearly independent and that they generate all of R3. So I can build anything in R3 out of them, but that when I find a solution, it is a unique solution. What are the coordinates of that, the zero vector? This is something that, you, that we should be able to rip off very easily because we know that zero times the first vector plus zero times the second vector plus zero times the third vector gives me the zero vector. Because it's a basis, they're linearly independent, so that's the only solution. So we can very easily say that the basis of the coordinates of V, of that zero vector, in relation to our basis is zero, zero, zero. Linear independence tells us it's the only way to do it. This we have this leads us to a concept of dimension. One thing that I haven't talked about yet, but is a very important concept in linear algebra. We've got, we've seen how there's all kinds of different bases for a vector space, for a subspace, or for Rn, whatever space you're looking at. There's all kinds of different bases. We've seen multiple ways of building a basis of R2. In fact, there's infinitely many ways of doing it. One important concept is that no matter what basis you take, it is going to have the same exact number of vectors. Any two bases of R2 is going to have two vectors. Any two bases of R5 is going to have five vectors. For subspaces, we've seen subspaces sometimes aren't the entire thing. If you have a basis, if you have two different bases, they are going to have the exact same numbers, number of elements, the exact same number of vectors. This is an important concept. This leads us to something called the dimension. So the dimension is the size of any basis. One of the subspaces we saw was the column space. And we saw how if you want to find a basis for the column space, as you recall from the last lecture, if you want to find the basis of a column space, you row reduce it, find all the pivot columns, and take those columns from your original matrix. So, so a basis of the column space is the number of pivot elements. That's a special one that we call the rank of a matrix. That is the dimension of the column space, which is the number of elements in the basis, which as we've seen, we find by, take, by finding all of the pivot columns. So the number of pivot columns is the rank of a matrix. Well, for example, find a basis for this subspace and what's its dimension? Well, you can see how this is constructed, that we essentially have three variables in here, R, T, and S. So, we can note that this is equal to R 
times uh, 6104 plus s times, well, there's no zero in the first one, negative 1, 5, negative 5, plus t times 1, 4, sorry, that should be plus 9t, 9 and 1. So that is our, that is a mathematical description, a vector description of this subspace. So what's the basis? Remember, a basis is the smallest generating subset. But this tells us that these three vectors span our set. So we have that V is the span of these three vectors, 6, 1, 0, 4, 0, negative 1, 5, negative 5, and 1, 4, 9, 1. So it spans it. Is that enough to say that it's a basis? Well, not quite. A basis is a spanning set or a generating set. We have a generating set, but it has to be um, linearly independent. So is this linearly independent? Well, to see if it's linearly independent, how do we do that? What we do is we're going to put them into a into a vector or into a matrix, 6, 1, 0, 4, 0, negative 1, 5, negative 5, add 1, 4, 9, 1. And we are going to row reduce it. So now we're going to do some row reductions. And I'm going to save you all from uh, having to go through all of the steps. But if you do some row reductions, you will come out with something like this. 6, 0, 1, 0, 9, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay. This is just getting it into uh, echelon form. You'll note when it's in echelon form, I have a leading entry there, there, and there. So I have three pivot columns. That means that it is a linearly independent set. So three pivot columns tells me we have a linearly independent set, or you can think about it that the uh, column space basis is all three columns. But what this means is that because it's linearly independent, that is a basis. Those three vectors generated any everything. They are linearly independent. So that means that it is a basis. So that means the basis is 6, 1, 0, 4, 0, negative 1, 5, negative 5, and 1, 4, 9, 1. So note that for a basis, you have to show two things. You have to show that it is a generating set, and you have to show that it is linearly independent. So the definition was that the number of vectors for a non-zero subspace V of Rn is called the dimension of V. Okay, so we saw in this previous example that we were dealing in R4, but we were dealing in a subspace. We were dealing, we had three basis vectors. We had a dimension three subspace. That means that there are things in R4 we won't be able to build from that. In other words, there is a null space. We're going to talk about null spaces again in a minute. One thing to note is that we talked about how the zero subspace is a subspace because it does meet all the all the requirements for a subspace we say the dimension of that subspace is zero even though there is a single vector the zero vector does generate it we actually say that the dimension of the zero subspace is zero so for example r2 has dimension 2 rn has dimension n and we just saw 
that that subspace gener that is defined by this has dimension three because it has three vectors in its basis. Example, what is the dimension of this? This is in R5, but we have the added condition that two of my vectors here are zero. So I could think of this, that this is zero, V2, zero, V4, and V5. So let's write this out in vector form. So this is equal to V2 times that vector plus V4 times this vector plus V5 times that vector. And that is everything in the set. That gives us a generating set. So, and remember, we had terms for this. We had, that was our second standard vector. The next thing was our fourth standard vector and the fifth standing standard vector. Remember, we used that terminology before. So that is a generating set for V. Is this linearly independent? Well, yes, they are. So we can see that E2, E4, and E5 are linearly independent. That means they are a basis. So that is a basis for V. So the dimension of our subspace is equal to three. We need three vectors. Now, that is the easiest generating set for it, the easiest basis. There are actually going to be infinitely many bases for this. Okay, A basis is not unique. There are almost always infinitely many bases for any vector space. What is unique is the dimension. Any basis is going to have the same number of elements. Here's a couple of theorems out of the book. Here's one that we're going to look at in a minute with an example, but it's a, an important idea. We talked about the rank of a matrix being the rank of its column space or the dimension of its column space. And we saw the column space was the number of pivot entries once you row reduce the number of pivot entries in that matrix. We've al already seen the concept of a null space being all of the things that turn into zero when you transform them with that matrix. Well, that's a subspace. The null space is a subspace, so it has a dimension. It has a basis and it has a dimension. This theorem tells us that the rank of our matrix plus the null space of our matrix, the rank of the, the dimension of the null space of our matrix is equal to the number of columns in our matrix. This is an important thing to, to understand. And we're going to see an example of it in a minute. The next theorem is the basis theorem. So I talked about how if you have any bases of any two bases of a vector space, they're going to have the same size. Well, it goes a little bit deeper than that. If you are in, if you have a vector space and you take any generating set that is linearly independent, or sorry, if you, if you know the dimension of your space and you take any linearly independent set of vectors, from your space, that number of vectors, it is automatically a basis. In other words, it is automatically going to generate your set. So for, in, for instance, for example, if we are in R5, I take any 
five vectors from R5 that are linearly independent are automatically a basis. Okay. So in other words, if we have a set that is linearly independent and generating, that's a basis. But if we know the dimension and we have a, a set of linearly independent vectors, the number that the number of vectors matches the dimension, automatically it's going to be a generating set and it is going to be a basis. So sometimes that's a shortcut. So like for instance with the example here, if I'm in R5 and I have any five vectors that are that generate or or that are linearly independent, I automatically know they're going to generate the, the entire set and that they're a basis. So here's our example. We are going to take this matrix and we're going to look for the column space and null space. And what are the dimensions of it? First off, we're going to first look for the column space. Remember how to find the column space. You take your matrix, you row reduce it, and you pick out the um, pivot vectors, or the, the, the pivot columns and take the vectors from those pivot columns. So we're going to do just a couple of row reductions is all we're going to need here. So I'm going to take a row 2 minus row 1 is the no row 2. 0, 1. I'm going to take row 3 minus 2 row 1 is the new row 3. And I get zero, 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 zero. This is enough. I'm initial on form. I have a leading entry here, a leading entry here. That tells me that I have two pivot columns. So the dimension of, of the column space of A, or we call it the rank of A, is equal to 2, and a basis for that is those two columns, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 2, 2. So that's the dimension of the column space. That's 2. What about the null space? So now we're going to look for our null space. Remember how we do the null space. We are looking for the things in our in our in our vector that turn into zero. So we augment with the zeros. If you've done this enough, you'll note that you don't have to put the zero column in there because it's always going to be zero. But just to be complete, I'm going to put it in there. So again, we're going to do the same same things. So we have row two minus row one is the new row two. Now, note that this is very repetitive. And that's actually one of the things that I want you to note. That you can do many of these operations kind of simultaneously because there's a lot of repetition to it. So row three minus two row two, is the new row three. Oops. And then our final row becomes all zeros. Now we're going to go one step further. We're going to take row one minus row three, the new row one, sorry, minus row two. So we get zero. Ah, I get one, zero, one, one, zero. And now I am in row reduced echelon form. I have my pivot columns, but I can write my equations to put it in vector form. 
So this gives me x1 plus x3 plus x4 is 0. And it gives me x2 plus x4 equals 0. Note that it tells me my x3 and x4 are free. So now let's write it in our vector form or in, in our equation form. We have x1 is negative x3 minus x4, x2 equals negative x4, and then I like to write x, my free variables in that form, just so I, ha I have it consistent. I can write it down in vector form now. So I have x1, x2, x3, x4 is equal to negative x3 times, oh, sorry, is equal to x3 times negative 1, 0, 1, 0, plus x4 times negative 1, negative 1, 0, 1. So my basis, which is the linearly independent generating set, is this, the two vectors that I've come up with. The dimension, or the dimension of the null space of A is equal to the number of vectors in here, and it's two. Note that the, the, our column space had a dimension two, our null space has a dimension two. You add those together, you get the number of columns. So that was the theorem that the, the dimension of the, of the column space or the rank of the, of the matrix plus the dimension of the null space is equal to, to the number of columns. A few cautions here. Take a look at the basis of our null space. It's, it's part of R4. It's a subspace of R4. Our column space is in R3. It was three, a size three elements. So your null space is usually sitting in a different size than your column space. But still you have this relationship that if you add up the two dimensions, you get the number of columns in your matrix. This leads into an extension of theorem eight. Theorem eight we first saw, it was called the invertible matrix theorem in section 2.3. And this is what we saw from, from that earlier lecture. A whole bunch of facts about invertible matrices. When you throw in the, the stuff we've just seen, dimensions and basis, you get some more things that are equivalent. So you have the invertible matrix, a continuation of the invertible matrix theorem. So if you have a square matrix and A is an if your matrix is invertible, you have some more facts about it. The columns are going to form a basis of Rn. Because remember, if a matrix is invertible, that means that if you row reduce it, every column has a pivot entry. So every column is a pivot column. That means that every column forms a linearly independent set and that set is going to generate all of Rn. So the columns form a basis for Rn if it's an invertible matrix, if and only if. The column space of A is Rn, what, what we just talked about. The dimension of that column space is N. We saw from that theorem that if the dimension of the column space is N, you add on the dimension of the null space, that means the dimension of the null space has to be zero, and the null space itself has to be the zero vector. The only zero dimension subspace is the zero vector itself. And you have the rank of A is equal to N, just from the definition of rank. So an invertible matrix has these additional properties when you take into account basis and dimensions. Again, to emphasize, 
we did an example show where we were showing that something what the uh, the the basis of a subspace was you have to show three things if you're trying to show that a set is a basis all of the vectors have to be in your subspace that's the first and most most fundamental one basis vectors can't be outside your subspace Then you have to show that it's either li linearly independent or as a generating set and compute the dimension and verify that the number of vectors is equal to the dimension. Alternatively, if you can show that your set is both linearly independent and generating set, you're doing the exact same thing. So you essentially have three, thi three things. You have to show two of them, show that it's linearly independent, a generating set, or that the, it matches the dimension. That's, when you do two of them, it guarantees the third one. And that wraps up uh, chapter two out of the book, Dimensions and Rank. Again, this pulls together a lot of the ideas we've seen. The important thing to understand out of this section is the interplay between all of these ideas, between linear independence, numbers of solution, uh, dimension, rank, null spaces, dimension of null space. We've seen a lot of concepts. The important thing is trying to understand how they all relate to each other and how, and how if you have one, you will have another property. So understanding those relationships between the properties is the really important takeaway from this chapter.